Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Chanel Hasten. I'm the Director of Outreach and Community Relations for the Alaka Alliance. This is our first webinar of 2024, so we're so pleased that you're here this evening. And our presentation tonight is Make Art Not Trash, an Artist's Call to Action with our guest speaker, Elizabeth Roberts. So firstly, I'm going to review a little bit about who the Alaka Alliance is, and then I will pass it over to Liz. So the Alaka Alliance, you can rem remember our name, Boom Shaka Laka. That's how I get a lot of people to remember. Alaka is actually a Chinook trading jargon word for sea otter. So we are a small nonprofit comprised of tribal and conservation leaders helping to aid in the return of Oregon's sea otter population back to their native waters on our Oregon coastline. We were created by the late David Hatch, who you can see there on the left-hand photo, uh, who was a member of the Siletz tribe. And uh, on the right is a photo of our most recent board meeting. Um, so we have a lot of amazing people. You can jump on our website and see who all these incredible individuals are helping lead this effort. So our mission, if I didn't already say it already, is to restore a healthy population of sea otters on the Oregon coast. And that thus helps make our marine ecosystem more robust and resilient. How so? Let's dive into that real quick. So um, an ecosystem imbalance is where everything is playing its role and say if a disease um, takes out a certain organism, another organism goes to take its place called resiliency. Um, so this is kind of the best case scenario. We have sea otters, we have sunflower sea stars in our kelp forests and eelgrass estuary habitats, making sure everything is in balance and functioning properly. But unfortunately, we had a big shift in this ecosystem off our coastline where we no longer have sea otters nor sunflower sea stars that help control the sea urchin population and sea urchins eat kelp. So without those predators, the urchins are overpopulating, leaving what are known as urchin barrens in their path. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how this all began. Um, so in the early um, 1870s, sorry, I forgot. I knew there was a typo I needed to <laughs> fix on the presentation. I'll remember to do that next time. Um, there was the maritime fur trade. So people started to realize um, Spanish and Russian and English traders that sea otter pelts were super duper warm, luscious, and people would pay a lot of money for them. So uh, they decided to hunt them to local extinction. Unfortunately, here on the Oregon coast, about 90% of the entire sea otter population was decimated due to the fur trade. So while sea otters have been absent in Oregon, another predator in the kelp forest ecosystem, the sunflower sea star with over 20 legs, uh, was controlling the sea urchin population. And unfortunately, they got hit with a sea star wasting disease in 2013-2015, and over 90% of that entire population was decimated, and they haven't really bounce back very much uh, to what they the numbers they used to have. And so what we're left with are what I said before, a lot of sea urchins without anything eating them. Um, so they are taking over entire kelp forests and just mowing them down, um, which is horrible because that's a whole entire ecosystem for thousands of other individuals and organisms in our underwater forests. So without human help, with sunflower stars or sea otters, uh, this entire ecosystem could be completely gone. So with sea otters, this is the healthy kelp forest, bull kelp forest habitat we'd like to see back on the Oregon coast. And so that is why our mission is so strong to do so. So how can you help us with our mission? Uh, you can visit our website, you can donate directly on there sign up for our social media and our RAF newsletter, which are also found in our website, and just spread the word that we don't have sea otters in Oregon because 90% of the people I talk to don't even know that we don't have sea otters out there and how important they are as ecosystem engineers and climate change warriors. 
So if you want to screenshot this real quick, this is all our social media handles. Um, you can get to our website through OregonSeaOtters.org too. It's a little easier to remember. Um, and also have a couple plugs before I pass it off to Liz. Um, dealing with art. So hopefully you enjoy this too. Um, we have a call for artists right now. Um, we're doing an art show for Seattle Awareness Week in September, on September 28th. Uh, the art show will be in Newport. So we're looking for artists to do something that is encompassing envisioning a future with Seattle's on the Oregon coast and what that means to you. You can visit our website or um, bit.ly slash otter art call. Uh, it's all posted on there or I can put it in the chat and that'll be easy too if you want to learn more on how to participate. And then also we have a sea otter sip and paint night. Uh, I haven't announced it yet anywhere else. So you are the first. First, that's your bonus for being on the webinar tonight, um, that it will be in Portland so you can come and learn how to paint this beautiful sea otter with an urchin and some bulk kelp, all in the name of sea otter conservation and tickets will go on sale soon. I will work on that. Um, but yeah, that will be a fun little art event you can do for yourself. So now uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening, local band in Oregon artist, Elizabeth Roberts. During this webinar, Liz will share her experiences working on large scale marine debris removal projects in the Gulf of Alaska, Gulf of Maine, um, doing sculptures for the Washed Ashore Project in Bandon and for a, I'm not gonna butcher that name in Norway. <laughs> I'll let you talk about that. Um, and she's been on the front lines of this issue for over a decade and continues to make it her mission to educate the public and inspire awareness through her art. And we're also very fortunate to have commissioned her to make a sea otter sculpture for the Alaka Alliance, which I'm sure she'll talk about in her presentation tonight. So I will pass it off to you, Liz. And also, I always forget this, but not right now. Remember to put your question and answers um, using the Q&A feature, or you can also do it in the chat because I think we are a little manageable in the amount of people we have right now. So I'll, off to you, Liz. Share my screen. There we go. Oops, that's perfect. Perfect, all right. So my story uh, starts in uh, July of 2013. I was part of a crew that traveled to Tagetic Island, which is in the southernmost uh, island down on the Trinity Islands here, uh, right down here in the Kodiak Archipelago. Uh, the island is managed by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game um, and is designated a critical habitat for harbor seals and ground nesting birds. So we spent uh, four weeks removing debris from a uh, large catcher beach and low-lying uh, wetlands stretching about 11 miles. So this is about roughly where uh, we flew in and uh, traveled down. Our base camp was located right about down there. Our crew uh, was base camped in an old uh, gold, uh, gold mining claim, like gold panning. And uh, we slept in tents and you can see here where our four-wheelers are parked. Um, here's our little tent city. And we uh, turned a an old outbuilding into a makeshift sort of communal living space and kitchen. Um, every morning we packed up our lunches and we spent the day rain or shine collecting lots of marine debris. Kind of see some of that here. Uh, we worked primarily with two four-wheelers equipped with trailers, which were used for transporting the crew and moving trash. All the debris we collected was then secured and staged uh, in numbered super sacks. So you can see those white sacks right here. Um, and those were gonna be picked up the following summer. Um, and in 2014, another crew returned to the island uh, to continue the project which culminated in a total of 12 weeks of labor and over 80,000 pounds of trash collected. It was then later removed uh, by landing craft and then brought to Kodiak town. And this is like one of the largest items we were able to remove, which was a lot of work. 
I often get asked, um, what is the most interesting thing I have ever found on my cleanups? And I have to say that these cards here, I found uh, three of these cards. Um, there are drift cards. Two of them were intact and one of them was just a fragment that had the identification number on them. And it, it basically said, you know, if you find this card, send it to Noah and we'll send you a dollar. And so I, I sent them in and I got an email response from them and they didn't know what they were. They ha had no idea. So they contacted Dr. Curtis Ebbesmeyer, who's a very well-known oceanographer to go digging through their archives. And what he came back with uh, was the first card that I showed you was released July 22nd in 1976 off of Meadow Point in Puget Sound. This one here was released the same day uh, off Dungeness Spits uh, in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And then the third one, this little fragment here, was released December 27th in 1976 in response to the Argo merchant oil spill off of Nantucket Island. So that was uh, pretty surprising to find that card. Um, basically in a nutshell, two cards drifted north from the Salish Sea and the third drifted east from Massachusetts, east to the vicinity of the UK, then north to Norway, east along the top of Siberia, south of through Bering Strait to Japan, then east to Canada, then north to Shalikov Strait, where it met those other two cards, because I found them within 100 meters of each other. Pretty remarkable. Um, in September that same year, 2013, and then again in 2014, I worked on a crew that conducted a shoreline cleanup along 70 miles of the northeast coast of Afognak Island and the east coast of Shuiak Island. These are the two northernmost islands in the Kodiak Archipelago. So you can see a fog neck up here and up here is Shuyak. Um, for this expedition, our base of operations was the 80-foot vessel Island Sea. The vessel was home to 16 crew, which included our captain, an engineer, a skiff driver, a cook, and 12 ground crew. Every morning, we were dropped ashore with our personal gear, a radio, first aid kit, air horn, some bear spray, and lots of bags. Uh, when we had finished cleaning a stretch of beach, uh, we would radio up for pickup and load our trash onto the skiff, and then would be dropped off at the next stretch of beach, um, often working 10 to 12 hour days. So this kind of gives you an idea of some of the things that we were finding. And here we are waiting for the skiff to come back and uh, haul the marine debris back to the boat. So all the debris was transported back to the vessel where it was stowed below decks uh, in the hold, as well as on the aft of the ship where it was secured in super sacks. We came across a large salmon seine net and we were able, with the help of some chainsaws and a lot of sweat equity, we were able to actually get this back on board the boat and remove it so that it didn't pose a threat to wildlife. It uh, uh, took about two or three days to fill the boat before we would make the six hour transit back to Kodiak to offload and weigh the debris. This shows you here, um, this is on Shuiak Island. A lot of times when you have big weather events, uh, a lot of debris gets pushed inland and in, in the, into the forest. So this is a little before and after. It's always very satisfying to leave a place cleaner than we found it. Well, this gives you an idea of the scale of what we were finding. It's a lot of trash. So uh, when we would offload, um, this is back in Kodiak, we would actually uh, weigh the debris and calculate uh, how much weight there was. And we had, uh, on this expedition, they were about 10 days long and yielded a total of 115,000 pounds of green debris. So this was stored in a yard in Kodiak for later removal. Uh, the most intensive cleanup project I participated in was on Kayak Island in July and August of 2014 near Cordova, Alaska. So this expedition was 28 days long and involved some of the most difficult logistics, terrain and weather conditions I've ever encountered. <laughs> because of the rocky shoreline and extremely shallow waters, getting the two four wheelers and trailers to shore was very challenging. Every day was ruled by the tides and there was only one point of entry in and out. Any day that we could safely get to shore, we worked regardless of the weather. 
Our daily commute consisted of a skiff ride from the island sea to a zodiac, from the zodiac to shore, where we would then hike across tidal flats to reach our four wheelers and begin our day. By the end of the expedition, our commute gained an additional hour and a half of driving each way to get to where we had left the course the day before. Every day kind of posed a new challenge. Uh, sometimes we'd find logs obstructing the only drivable path and we'd have to move them by group force or by chainsaw. Radio communication was pretty spotty and resupplies were rarely an option due to remoteness and inaccessibility. It was always important for us to plan ahead and be prepared. Wildlife encounters were always a risk because as you know, Alaska has a lot of bears. Um, safety precautions were always taken. It was not uncommon for us to work 12 hour days when the weather uh, and tides were favorable. All of the debris we collected was geocached into groups of three to four super sacks. So you can see the sacks here. They were all geocached and secured, numbered and lashed together for removal later by a helicopter. All the tsunami debris that we found, because there was a lot of stuff that washed up from the 2011 uh, tsunami in Japan. We did take photographs of that and documented all of it. And then hazmat items that we'd find, you know, uh, sometimes you'd find old medical waste or, um, you know, um, ha hazardous chemicals. And so we would move those things um, out of where the way they'd be washed back out and would geocache those uh, for later uh, removal. We were not allowed to actually remove those things. So we did put them somewhere where they could be collected at a future date. Uh, cleanup continued in the summer of 2015. I was not on that expedition, but a total of 130,000 pounds of debris was removed by helicopter and it was loaded onto a large barge. So this is actually two barges that were welded together for this project. Um, and the barge then went on to collect debris stockpiled throughout the rest of Alaska. And it stopped in British Columbia on its way to Seattle with the intention that all of this would be sorted through and recycled. Unfortunately, um, the city of Seattle deemed it hazardous waste and wouldn't let us sort it. And so it ended up in a landfill in eastern, uh, northeastern Oregon, which was bad. <laughs> in the summer of 2000, well, actually 2014, I moved back to Oregon from Alaska and um, discovered that the beaches here were not, almost as dirty as the ones in Alaska. And so I did spend some time doing some cleanups out in some of the remote areas in the plover habitat restoration area. Snowy plovers, they are um, a endangered species here on the Oregon coast. And so there's been a lot of effort to uh, bring their numbers back. And while a lot of Oregonians are really great at keeping their public beaches clean, because of the inaccessibility of these sites, they were often overlooked. So I did a lot of uh, cleaning up in some of these areas. Here's kind of a selection of things that I was collecting for art. Um, and so in 2015, I started volunteering with the Wash to Shore Project. This is Angela Hazeltine Potsy. She is the founder of the Wash to Shore Project. And these are some of the sculptures that I helped create uh, during my time volunteering. This is a Mako shark and a seal. So in the summer of 2015, I had the opportunity to travel to the Gulf of Maine and participate in a three-week expedition with the Roselia Project aboard the 60-foot research sailing vessel, American Promise. We worked in partnership with Parlay for the Oceans and the Maine Heritage Coastal Trust, cleaning hard-to-reach shorelines and collecting data on remote islands. This was unlike any expedition I had previously been a part of, as it was more focused on science and data collection than it was on actual cleanup. So we didn't clean a shoreline in its entirety, um, but rather just kind of within a preset parameter where the debris was collected, sorted, and documented. All of the debris we removed was brought on board and staged at the Center for Science and Leadership on Hurricane Island. During our visits to the island to drop off trash, we would engage with students and share our work and invite uh, them aboard to see our ROV in action. So there's a bunch of students that were there designing and developing their own ROVs. And then here they are on board. We actually sent our ROV down and found something cool that we brought back up. So the Roselia Project, they use the ROV to survey debris levels on the seafloor and will often employ a drone 
to survey accumulations along remote shorelines. So during my time aboard the American Promise, we visited five islands, including Great Dot. Uh, we went to Long Island and Acadia National Park on Isla Ho, as well as Matinicus Island. So each community, we gave a public presentation on our work that included data gathered uh, earlier in the day. That way the presentation would have a more meaningful impact and inspire residents to take action within their own community. This is park staff at uh, on Isla Ho at Acadia National Park, which was really beautiful. Um, so balloons were just as common um, as this chest freezer it was uncommon to find while we were transiting. These things were just floating out in the ocean. This was pretty crazy. We, had, we did manage to get it on board, thankfully. Um, one thing we did discover quite by accident um, is the power of a trash sort in a public space. Um, due to weather, we had to hold off sorting uh, trash from one of our cleanups and brought it with us to sort in Rockland uh, Harbor. Uh, this drew a great deal of attention from the public and gave us an opportunity to educate people about the growing amount of trash in our oceans. All of the debris staged on Hurricane Island was sorted into number one and number two recyclable plastics, mixed hard plastics, which tend to be used for building like playground equipment, park benches and things like that. And then what couldn't be recycled was sent for waste to energy or it was uh, incinerated to create electricity. So I'm happy to report that none of that uh, made it into the landfill. So after that expedition, I, um, was hired on to work full-time as an artist for Washed Ashore. And one of my first projects that I was tasked with was to refurbish Priscilla the parrotfish to get her ready for her debut at the Smithsonian National Zoo in Washington, DC. This is in 2016. And here she is uh, on opening day of the exhibit. And it was really fun for me to sit uh, on the bench and listen to visitors uh, reactions to the sculpture you know they would start out being completely amazed by how beautiful it was and then absolutely horrified when they realized that it was made completely out of plastics that came out of the ocean here's some of the other sculptures that we had on exhibit it's octavia the octopus i believe she's trying to come back to bandon to get refurbished and a giant jellyfish so in, this is uh, Angela and I, we were building a uh, coral reef, a bleached coral reef out of styrofoam. And here you can see it completed. And this was actually built in the same building where the they were doing research on corals at the National Zoo. So that was really neat to actually see the corals and build this exhibit alongside them. Um, I did get to go but return later that year to the Our Ocean Conference at the U.S. State Department in Washington, D.C., where we installed art for an international conference on plastic pollution in the ocean. So that was pretty exciting to kind of see behind the scenes. And here's Priscilla again outside the U.S. State Department. And it was pretty cool because I was scrolling on Instagram and came across this picture <laughs> of Leonardo DiCaprio um, taking a selfie in front of Priscilla. So in the spring, actually, no, here we go. This is a little bit more about Wash Ashore and how we build sculptures at Wash Ashore. Um, you can volunteer and come into the workshops and you can help assemble these panel pieces that are made up of pre-cut and drilled plastics and recognizable items. Um, once those are assembled, uh, we use like metal framework that the sculptures are built based off of and we'll cover those with a plastic skin. So that gives us something to screw those panels to. And here I am working on the paws of a polar bear. You can see the finished paws there. And here's the completed polar bear. I believe, and this is uh, Steve, the weedy sea dragon. Um, these are some of the la a few last sculptures that I built during my time at Wash to Shore. This was a, a great white shark that we did. That was pretty fun. Um, I got invited to get, return to Kodiak, Alaska, where I lived for 18 years. Um, I was brought back by the Kodiak Island Borough School District and the Kodiak Arts Council to do a two-week artist in residency in the schools. Um, they had done a series of cleanups that summer and wanted to turn some of that trash into art. And so I felt kind of like, if you've ever seen the show Chopped, 
where they give chefs like mystery ingredients and they have to turn it into something. I felt a lot like that because I had no idea what I was going to be working with until I got there. So uh, I got to use the maintenance building uh, shop, use the bandsaw to prep materials. We took over the, the school library and it was fun because the kids got to use the drill press and help me prep materials. Uh, I had a good friend uh, weld some framework because we were going to build some jellyfish sculptures. And the kids helped prep all the materials to put these uh, jellyfish together. So these are some plastic uh, bottle bottoms that were wired together. And you can kind of see how everything got assembled. This was a really fun project. And here's some of the kids that I got to work with. And this was cool because I actually used to work in this school as a teacher's aide uh, years ago, which was really fun to revisit as an artist. And um, this was a mural that I built for them that's still hanging in the school. Um, that summer, um, I did get to an opportunity. This is right here, this is teachers. Uh, I did a workshop with teachers, kind of showing them how to use art, uh, marine debris for making art so that they could incorporate that into their curriculum. And here's some of their little finished projects. Um, so that summer, I was invited to Norway by an artist collective called Bemlo Kunstlag. And I spent a month in Norway. Um, this is uh, my friend Jana with the red hair. Uh, Martha is the woman next to her. Um, she's the welder that was going to be welding the framework. And I'm, I'm fortunately, I do not remember the, this gentleman's name, but he owned the building that we uh, were working in, which was a really cool building. Um, it was, they restored like antique boat engines in there. So this was, uh, they did a series of cleanups in Norway after a rare cuvier beaked whale had swam into one of the harbors. Um, and they kept trying to get it to go back out, but unfortunately it was really sick and they had to euthanize it. And when they did the necropsy, they found its stomach was full of plastic. So it sparked a national conversation about plastic pollution in the ocean. And so my friend Yana had reached out to me and uh, wanted me to come visit them and help them build a sculpture. And so we got to work cleaning all the debris that was collected. And there's uh, Martha, she is welding framework. And here we are sorting and cutting and prepping. Kind of see it in process here. And working on the fins. And it was great because we had volunteers come in and help put this together. You kind of see it coming along. And that's it, finished. And so this sculpture is actually touring around Norway still. It, it moves from different museums and different uh, culture houses and place like, places like that. So it's still doing its work to educate the public about plastic pollution in the ocean. Um, yeah, there's one more picture. So in 2018, uh, this is a picture of a plastic chair. I don't know about you, but I certainly sat on a chair exactly like that um, in grade school in the 70s. Um, so this was found locally. Um, and I knew it would come in handy for something because in 2018, uh, my friend Ron Popish, um, he is uh, another artist who does, does a lot of artwork uh, for interpretive panels for the wildlife refuges the, up and down the Oregon coast. And so we collaborated on this bass sculpture, the striped bass for the Nori Point Environmental Center in Statsburg, New York. Of course, we're goofing off and having fun doing it. But this kind of shows you some of the items that I'm using. Um, I've got some baseball cap brims here. These are rice, uh, rice paddle spoons, pieces of sneakers. Uh, and I'm using those as the bottom of a bleach bottle. I'm using those to create the bottom jaw of the fish. You can see some soup spoons from Japan. And this is the completed sculpture. And so you can see that there's actually a really great YouTube video called Trash Bass. Um, it's put out by the Nori Point Environmental Center where they talk about this piece. Um, and you can see it in more detail. Uh, I did get a chance to visit Hawaii in 2018. I went and stayed with another marine debris artist um, and got to a chance to visit the South Island, uh, South side of the Big Island, and was absolutely mortified by the amount of trash that was there. Um, I thought I had seen it all doing cleanups in Alaska, but I had apparently not. So. It was really heartbreaking because when you think of the Hawaiian islands, you think of paradise. 
So we did do a beach cleanup. Um, we did uh, clean up in this little cove area. It doesn't seem like it's much, but I feel like every little bit helps. You know, it's a little bit overwhelming. But yeah, it'll just look like that for miles and miles. It's kind of kind of sad to see it. In 2019, I was invited back to Alaska, this time to Petersburg, Alaska. And I spent some time working in the school there with students. Um, we did a community like art project that uh, hung in the Petersburg Community Library. And so the kids and I made a piece called Waste Stream where they made, uh, there's the library. And so they made little water bottle fish and little plastic bottle jellyfish. And we hung it all from the ceiling. And then also some kids made art with uh, recycled bottles and stuff that they had brought from home. And so we made a bunch of different fish. These were really fun to make. Petersburg doesn't get a lot of marine debris. They're a lot more sheltered. So we had to get more creative and repurpose materials that they did have on hand. So during the, this is a piece that I built for the school in Petersburg. Um, I feel like every time I do one of these, I get more and more detailed. So this is hanging at the elementary school. So if you're ever in Petersburg, Alaska, you can stop by the school and check it out. And this was at the unveiling. So the kids got to see it because it was a big secret. They knew I was working on something, but they didn't get to see it until the final reveal. So it was pretty cool. And so in during the pandemic, that kind of shut a lot of things down for me. I had a bunch of projects that I was going to do. But um, during the pandemic, I, I was contacted by... Uh, a film crew from Oregon State University that were working on a short film in partnership with uh, the Oregon Coast Visitors Association and Travels or Travel Oregon. So they came to my studio um, a couple of times and and filmed with me. This was an octopus piece that I was working on at the time. And they put together a short film called Oregon's uh, Creative Edge. Um, which is Oregon's Edge of Creative South Coast. And you can find that on YouTube. Um, it's a nine minute film and it features not only my work, but also the work of other folks that are coming up with some very creative solutions um, for restoring our kelp forests and others. So I, I totally recommend you seeing it. It's a beautiful uh, short film. Um, and this past year, um, I had the pleasure of partnering with Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition, and we were able to work with the Forest Service to get volunteers out to those remote places that I was talking about earlier uh, in the clover habitat restoration areas. So I was finally able to get an, an organized effort out there to clean those areas. Um, and they're absolutely beautiful remote places. And this was uh, one of the first days we spent three days at three different sites. Um, cleaning up stuff. And the best part was that all of that stuff went to wash ashore. They came and picked it up for us. And then to follow up on that, we spent three days in schools down in Curry County working with students. And I devised a project where I would do a drawing. I transferred this drawing to three foot by six foot canvas panels that they would kind of fill in like kind of like a paint by number and then we'd photograph each panel so there was 14 panels in total um, and then use photoshop to stitch them all together to reveal the final image so the kids really didn't know what they were making until um, it had all been stitched together at the end and this was the final image of two snowy plovers this was a really fun project. I think we might be doing something similar again uh, later this spring. So I'm kind of excited. And then I also partnered with Red Fo Redfish Rocks community team out of Port Orford um, to do a mural for the Port Orford Visitor Center depicting the Redfish Rocks Marine Reserve. And this one was a really fun one to do. You can see more detail in here. And all of those pieces that look like rocks are actually melted pieces of plastic. And the kelp, so these are tennis balls that were cut in half. 
This is a rim of a trash can that I found. And then this is just a really interesting piece of plastic that I found. And that brings me to my partnership this year with the Alaka Alliance. Um, they reached out asking if I would be interested in creating a sea otter sculpture for them. So this is kind of what it looked like to start with. Um, these are some of the materials I pulled uh, to start on that project. And you can kind of see I'm starting to fit things together and trying to create the shape that I need. I think this came off of a a big wheel tricycle. I don't know if any of you remember those, but I sure do. Um, this is me kind of putting together, fabricating a tail and kind of starting to get the shape. And these are some of the feet, these little flipper feet that I was working on. So you can see there, it's starting to take shape and look a bit more like a sea otter. So I think this was like a coffee filter that I found. And this is it coming along, starting to add whiskers. And there's this little mouth with his little teeth. And that's the completed piece. I think it turned out pretty cool. And they have it touring around uh, different places. I'm not sure where it's gonna pop up next, but it was at the, at the South Slough for a while and the Charleston Marine Life Center. And then I think it made an appearance at Seven Doubles. So, um, if you're interested in following more of my work, um, you can follow me on Facebook. I have a page called Make Art Not Trash. Or if you wanna see more of my sculptures and how I built them. Um, and also I have some links up on my Instagram page uh, for some radio interviews that I've done and also the link to some short films and whatnot. Um, check out my, my Instagram page at Marine Debris 911. Well, I really appreciate you guys uh, tuning in tonight. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, let's see. Oh, the Alaska cleanups. Yeah, so those were done um, with in partnership with Gulf of Alaska Keeper and also with um, Island Trails Network out of Kodiak. So that was a partnership between both of those organizations see thanks Liz yeah every time I see that oh. little sea otter sculpture it makes me smile it's just so darn cute when you see it in person um and it is touring right now it is January 16th and it will be um for the next 10 days at the Gold Beach Visitors Center so if you're down on the south coast please hop in there and you can see it for yourself we have a page on our website where we update where it's going to next. I think it's going to travel a little more north up the coast soon. So if you have a location on the coast that you're interested in seeing the sea otter uh, stay at for a couple of weeks, let us know and we'll work it out. Okay, while we wait for some more questions, I have a question. What was the hardest sculpture you've ever made i'm honestly that sea otter was the, <laughs> probably the most challenging one i've done because it's it's on a smaller scale and working yeah. on a smaller scale is a lot harder than working on those large scale, scale sculptures for wash ashore so that one that one was intensive <laughs> a lot it was challenging I had moments where I questioned whether or not I was going to be able to pull it off. <laughs> you did it. It's beautiful. Um, I I love the picture. That parrotfish also just makes me giggle with the little parrot mouth teeth and everything. And with Leo taking a picture in front of it, that's pretty awesome. Pretty I didn't cool. know that. Yeah. Um, What's can you talk about any other future projects or are you working on um a sculpture right now? No, I'm I actually do have a piece I want to build, um a mural piece that I'd like to build. But um I do plan on working some more with Oregon Shores. I'm probably gonna be partnering with Wash Ashore again. Um they're interested in having me come back and work with them. So nothing solidified yet, but um, you know, it's I'm pretty excited to get back to making art when the weather warms up a little bit. It's a bit cold for me to be working in my studio space right now. Yeah. 
Uh, Margo has a question. How do you clean off the pieces? What do you do for safety precaution wise to make sure everything's clean? So when I bring things home, I first I rinse them off, um, rinse all the sand off. Um, I soak a lot of things in vinegar, especially the smaller things. Uh, and then everything kind of gets washed in hot soapy water and then laid out to dry and then it gets sorted and put away. So I figure I touch everything about five or six times because of picking it up off the beach, rinsing it off, <laughs> washing it, and then sorting it, putting it away, and then using it again for art. So, what? Um, where is that snowy plover project? So that is actually not a physical piece because of the the size of it. Um, we worked with 14 classrooms and each classroom did a panel that was three foot wide by six foot long. Oh, so wow. the, yeah, so it was basically we photoshopped all of those pieces together and then printed them up on um, like photo paper and gave them to the school so they could hang them in the schools. Oh, neat. Yeah, that was really incredible. How what a cool like youth group project to do and raise awareness about plastic pollution. I love it. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. That's very neat. Uh, do we have any more questions out there? Don't be shy. What's what's do you have like a dream? ocean animal you want to create that you haven't created yet well i actually really want to build a killer whale oh. just because they are coming back since i've moved back here they're starting to reappear and they've been into coos bay a couple times actually come all the way up the coos river into the bay um and i know when i lived in kodiak it was always exciting uh when the killer whales came in to town um you know they'd get if you were listening to public radio you know they'd let you know hey the whales are in the harbor and so people would rush down to, to see the killer whales and i feel like that's the same thing here now that they're returning and so i'd love to build a killer whale piece i would love to help volunteer and help you with that because i also really love killer whales don't tell the sea otters that okay. um, <laughs> Jeff has a question. Has debris itself ever inspired the specific sculpture that you would make of it? Yes, for sure. Um, for the octopus, I found um, a stuffed animal eye and that inspired the whole piece for me. Um, another time I found a crushed oil bottle that reminded me of the head of a sperm whale it was just the perfect shape and so I did make a small wall piece um, I don't have it anymore but um, yeah definitely I'll find things that inspire um, a piece so it works both ways sometimes I don't know what I'm going to make and have to go digging for things but every now and again I'll find something that inspires me to want to make something with it so um Holly Ann says, so the Curry County School District project, do those 14 panels not exist anymore that they made or do they still have them? No, they were just um, done on canvas where we just laid the canvas panels on the floor. I had um, used a projector to transfer each section onto that piece of canvas. And so they just built their, their panel. And when we photographed it, everything got taken apart so that the next group could use those same materials. Um, so the materials kind of got repurposed um, for each panel. Neat. Very cool. Let's see. Any more questions? These are some great ones. Kim says, thanks, Elizabeth, for making art from garbage and encouraging humans to be more aware of the plight of our oceans, rivers, and our waterways. I second that. <laughs> Thanks, Kim, for joining us tonight. Let's see, I had another question for you, but it escapes me. What was it? Oh, so um, I know you've been tabling at different um, fairs and such. Where can we see you next where people can purchase some um, of your smaller artwork? I think I'm probably going to 
throw some stuff up on the wall here at Bandon Rain at the cidery here in Bandon. Um, I think that's going to happen soon, but I, I, I haven't had art for sale in a long time just because I've been doing a lot of commission pieces, but, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully, yeah, um, I'll have some stuff up on the walls here soon. Awesome. And if somebody wants to reach out also, like, and you know, if they're interested, um, I can send some photographs of what I have available as well. Super. Let's see, Brad from Wash to Shore says that we value all you've done and what you're doing is, or let's see, we've done and you're doing for inspiring action to protect our oceans with your art. Um, Jeff asks if any of your art is articulated or internally lit. Uh, I haven't done anything internally lit. Um, the octopus is somewhat articulated. Um, some of the tentacles are can be positioned and moved, um, but I haven't done anything fully articulate yet. And even the sea otter, I didn't point this out because I didn't have any good pictures of it. Um, I actually built in a pocket because I don't know if you know this, but otters, they have pockets or little folds of skin under their armpits where they like to either store their favorite rock for smashing shellfish or a little snacks for later. And so I actually built a pocket in there that can be opened and it's got a little sand toy of a little sea snail in there. <laughs> I totally forgot about that too. I know that's. I got it. obsessed with otter pockets for. <laughs> uh, um, let's see. Someone else asked, "How can we find out about opportunities to volunteer to help you create some art?" Um, you can volunteer with Washed Ashore. They're always looking for volunteers. Um, just if you want to, you know, you're out at the coast and you see any marine debris, you can pick that up. There's a couple drop-off points. Uh, one is here in Bandon over by the Bandon's Fisheries Warehouse. Um, back behind there, they have a, a dumpster or collection spot by the dumpster where you can leave your bags of trash. And I believe there's also another spot um, in Coos Bay, North Bend, but I'm not 100% sure where that's at, but it might be listed on their website. Thanks. Brad just put in the chat that the workshops were washed ashore the second and fourth Saturdays, and you can find out more at washedashore.org. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Brad. All right. With no more questions, um, I think we can wrap it up for this evening. Thanks so much, Liz. We look forward to hopefully another fun partnership with you. What to do next is the question, uh, but I do seriously want to help you with that orca because I have bought a lot of orca art within the last six months <laughs> in my <laughs> house um, and I have dreams about them all the time. So there's a reason for that. Um, but yes, we appreciate you and everything you're doing for ocean conservation, awareness and plastic pollution, especially here in Oregon. It's super important. Um, and thank you from all of us at the Law Alliance. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>